Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so what I want to talk about is this QDX transmitter, transceiver. A, a number of you may be familiar with QRP Labs, which is a little outfit in Turkey. It's, it's run by a guy named Hans Summers, who's um, English, trained as a physicist, did worked in industry for a while, and at some point moved his family and his little side business doing ham radio things of one kind or another, moved to Turkey where he's been basically supporting himself, make, making a variety of small kits, mostly all essentially low power, uh, with a variety of things, not only transceivers, but there's, there's a, a, a GPS clock, there are GPS um, units. He, he has a little um, device that will kind of do very light, very lightweight thing, uh, which will transmit Whisper, uh, which has flown on a number of those balloons, um, one of which was shot down last, last weeks ago. Uh, on its seventh trip around the world, that one is a was a big balloon. But a lot of these, the, the, there was a big uh, fuss about seven eight years ago. People started buying mylar party balloons like you get at Publix. You know the little ones about a foot square, filling with hydrogen. You put two of them together with a little this little transceiver that Hans had designed and sold, uh, together with a GPS unit and a solar cell, and. So the unit would transmit whisper with a, basically milliwatts of power, and it was a specially encoded message, but whisper stations it, all over would pick up these signals, and so you could track this balloon as it wandered around in the atmosphere. And so the, the first ones would go, you know, like they launched them from Toronto, and they would make it across the Atlantic. And people... For, Either people got better at this or luck changed, but eventually they started going all the way around the world. And then they go around the world several times. And so now it seems to be, they've got this down so uh, where these things go around the world multiple times. The one, the one that got shot down over the Yukon the gun was uh, finishing its seventh trip around the world. So these balloons just drift wherever the winds take them. They're drifting at about 30, 40,000 feet, and they just go. And um, it's amazing how, how, well, it's amazing one thing and with this tiny power, I mean, milliwatts of power, stations listening on whisper frequencies all over the planet can pick them up. And so you can kind of, and the, the message encodes telemetry. So you can find out where it is, you can find out what the temperature it's at, you can find out its altitude. All. All, so, so it's it's become kind of routine now, as opposed to five six years ago, and it was a big deal. But anyway, about I think probably about six or seven years ago, Hans came out with a design called the QCX. The QCX was a five watt CW only single band transceiver. Your face. Oh, okay. Um, and um, you could you you bought the kit. You can build it for any band, basically 80, uh, 80, 40, 30, or twenty. It tended to people would also try and use it on seventeen, fifteen, but because of the nature of the thing, the power would go down as you went up. And but the QCX was it was it was a kit. It was all through all parts. It, it had a lot of features for a tiny little thing. It was all run by the same processor that's in an Arduino. Um, it had a, it had Morse code keyer. It had frequency control. You could tune it in you know one hertz steps. Um, it was um, it had a keyer. It had a decoder. It could decode CW, and uh, it even had a built-in key. So um, this sold for about forty-five dollars. And it caught on, and all of a sudden, thousands thousands of people wanted to build these things. It became a problem for Hans to just keep keep the deliveries up. And uh, anyway, during COVID, um, he he was fooling around. He came up with 
a digital version of this. So the QD, this is the QDX. This is a small, I mean, my small, it's in a box about this. I forgot to bring mine. It's in a box about this big, about three by five by about an inch high. It runs on 12 volts. It does all a whole bunch of digital modes. I'll, I'll talk about which ones in a minute, but it does the five watts output on 80, 40, 30, and 20, four bands. And it does full digital output and it's a transceiver. That is, it's a complete radio. What you get back, this thing looks just like your 7300. It, you know, there's audio coming back from it. There's audio going to it. All the FT8 kind of stuff is done on this little tiny board. Um, so it was kind of it was kind of nice in itself, but there's some very interesting things about the way the QDX does its its in particular how it transmits the digital, which makes it really interesting. But to do that, I'm gonna to have to step back and talk about how you generate an FT8 signal. You use FT8 as an example, and then compare it to how you generate the signal with a, with a conventional sideband ring. And then what the what the QDX does that's different. So that's the and 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 it's a, the reason it's interesting because you it gives you a really serious insight into what really is involved in sending di frequency shift keying digital signals. So so what is the QDX? It's a five watt digital transceiver, four bands, handles many but not all digital modes. It won't do PSK thirty one, for example. Um, it's small, it's a set about three by five by one. Um, it does both receive and transmit, and there is no IQ processing. It's all done on the, on the transceiver. What goes back and forth is the same kind of audio that goes back and forth on a, any kind of commercial Kenwood, ICOM, whatever. So here's this block diagram. Um, it's got... It's got um, the, the received part is across the top. It's got a set of bandpass filters that are switched depending on the band. Um, there's a quadrature, fancy thing, quadrature sampling detector. That's what a lot of people call a TALO detector. It's basically um, it's basically a switch that switches the input every quarter of a cycle. So you're getting samples of a, each cycle you get samples at zero, 90, 180, and 270 degrees. So you get four samples per cycle at whatever frequency you're at. And so these are analog samples. And they're then, by adding, adding the zero and 180 and the 90 and 270, you, you're getting the, what they call the quadrature signal, you're getting an I and a Q signal what you did just amplify the, these are now at audio, amplified by audio, and there's a, and then they're digitized. That's what the little backwards boxes are. That's the standard way of showing an A to D. That is, it's <clears throat> it's analog in, digital out, and that's picked up by a microprocessor, which will then do a whole bunch of stuff with the audio. Um, on the RF side. The RF side is really simple. There's this thing called RF signal generator, which is an which is an SI5351, which in case anybody has not heard of it, it's a tiny little chip that has three independently controllable oscillators that can be programmed in sub hertz steps between about three and two hundred megahertz. So each and each each of the three oscillators can be programmed independently. So you can get, generate three frequencies out of this thing. And in addition, you can control the phase. That's one of the things that Hans figured out and he talks about, it's essentially with the QC Act first, is how you can control the phase of these things. So for example, you could have two outputs at the same frequency, but 90 degrees out of phase. Which is, which is why the, the IQ is simple with this thing. But on the transmit, all you need is one frequency. And that's, the, that's the beauty of this thing. This, this thing is programmed to do one frequency, which goes through the amplifier and then out through the bandpass filters to your antenna. 
So <clears throat> relatively straightforward. There's a lot of stuff that's happening in this box over in the lower lower right, which is a microprocessor. And I'll talk about that as we go along. So let's talk about an FT8 signal. This is a good example of a digital signal. So you start with an FT8 signal and the, the most common thing you want is your call, his call, and a grid square or signal report. So that's, that's the basic information. And so Taylor, who, who originally, Frank and Taylor, that's the FT of FT8, have arranged, how do you take all this information and encode it in as few bits as possible? And what they figured out is that you need 28 bits to cover any possible call sign. Um, and then you need another 15 bits for the grid or signal report. And so collectively you need a bunch, you need 28 plus 28 plus 15 bits just for your basic message. But if you send that out, the odds are good that you're gonna lose bits and then you won't know what got sent. So what the FTA does is adds forward error correction, which is a fancy way of saying, we're gonna add a lot of extra bits, like kind of like parity bits, but in a more complex way, so that if you lose some bits, that you can reconstruct what was lost. And these things can reconstruct up to about 50 lost bits. So there's, there's really, this really enables you to get relatively weak signals because when you lose a little bit on a weak signal, you can still reconstruct the original message. Um, the FTA is, is known to have, a, it, it can detect signals down to about 25 or so dB below the noise level. That's the noise level in the three kilohertz bandwidth, not the noise level within the width of the signal itself. And each signal, each FT8 signal is sent out in a 50 hertz band that's sent out in a number of individual frequencies. So you, so you add all these forward error correction bits and some extra synchronizing bits, and you get other, all together you end up sending out 174 bits. And so the way it's sent out is you break it up into three bit pieces. So each three bit pieces is three bits represent any number from zero to seven. There's eight different bits. So what those eight bits get encoded into is audio frequencies between small audio frequencies spaced by about six tenths of a hertz. And so what you do to send it out is what you want to do is send out whatever your transceiver dial is set for. Plus, if you're an FT8, you know you set your where you want your transmit signal in terms of audio. And so you add that to the dial frequency. And then on top of that, you add one of these eight um, little audio tones that encodes three bits. So what's coming in in the receiver is every quarter of a second or so is a new audio tone. And what, what the receiving software does is it keeps track of all these tones and then reconstructs the message. And it's actually reconstructing not just one message, but every message within the passband, which is usually about three kilohertz. And if any of you have ever done FT8 on 20 meters in the evening, you know, there can be easily 40 or 50 of these signals that is decoding all at once in a two second spot, in a two second bit. So um, it, there's a lot of stuff happening under the hood, um, but <clears throat> it, they, this is all set up in the, the, the protocol. It's all set up. There was actually a QEX article. You can go searching around on the on Google and you can pick up the original article that was in QEX by Frank and Taylor that tells you everything you want to know about the protocol. But so the idea is an FTH signal is really a series of tones imposed on your carry but it's sent out as SSB, which means there's nominally no carrier. There's only one sideband. And in that sideband, there's that one audio tone. So you're getting it, but what we're gonna see is that the QDX does this differently from your standard SSB rate. Go. Come on. 
the key at the point is this. At any instant, when you're doing frequency shift carrier, there is only one signal, one frequency being transmitted. So in an SSB rig, that's, that's, it doesn't, you don't need all the fancy apparatus that goes with the sideband ring to generate one frequency. But since most of us are stuck with a transceiver, you, you end up sending out what you hope is one signal, but it's got a lot of other stuff with it. You know, there's always a suppressed carrier that's not gone. There's always some sideband from the other sideband. There's often other hash that's imposed. And on top of that, you have a lot of stuff to generate this one signal. And what Summer's insight was, is you don't need all that stuff to generate this kind of signal. So, you don't need the complex apparatus of a full sideband radio to generate one frequency. All you need is an oscillator that you can program. Um, you just see, all you need is an oscillator and amplifier. Well, the 5351 can be programmed in subvert steps. So you can program it exactly and it can be done fast. All you need to do is the, the microprocessor running this simply has to compute the new frequency every two tenths of a second. The microprocessor is running it. I think the, I think the processor he's got on it runs at 600 megahertz. You know, not so long ago that was a that was a fast computer, right? It's in in you know, go go ask yourself what was in my laptop in 2005, and and you'll find it was probably running about that. So this, but the idea is you're just programming the oscillator. So you have the simple oscillator. You set a new frequency, amplify it, and push it out on the antenna. There's one frequency going out, no sidebands, no nothing. As simple as you can possibly get. The, um, so you, you, you don't need all the fancy filters and, and heterodynes and mixers and whatever that go in an SSB rig to generate a full digital signal. So here's the entire transmitter of the QDX. This is the transmit side. You're getting two signals from the SI5351. And you say, why are there two signals? You only told me I need one. They are the same frequency, but they're 90 degrees out of phase. And why? Because they go into this, these, this these gates and all the gates are as really as buffers to generate to give you a little bit more thing. Driving these four BS one seventies, which are a class D amplifier. So in class D, it's a switched amplifier. You you turn on one side, turn on the other side. So they're they're alternately you turn one side on full and the other side is off, and then you flip it around. So you're getting a full square wave, and then. Just a standard, you know, output transformer going to low pass filter. Um, so this is a class D, which by the way, has the advantage of all switching type amplifiers that it's very efficient. You, 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 you the, the transistors, they're either on or off. So you're not losing any, you're not dissipating any heat there. It's all just, it, all your switching is going into energy going out. So <clears throat> that's that's the that's all you need to prove the FDA, um what what else um ready ready is just sending two tones it's either mark or space so this 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 thing will just send it and all, you, all the processor is just shifting the frequency depending on in, in some fashion that depends on what mode you're using. If it's FTA, every fraction of a second that has to shift a new tone. If it's ready, it's just going back and forth at a 45 blog between mark and space. So that's that's it for that's that's the whole that's all you need. There's two gates, four transistors, and a transformer. Oh, and I should include the 5351 up there, and then the microprocessor driving it. The microprocessors are like 
they're just this around like cockroaches, right? Anyhow, um, the receive chain is not much more complicated. Um, this is this little box in the middle is a, is just a switch. It's it's actually a digitally controlled switch. So there are two inputs Z and W, and there are two clock chains called A and B. And depending on the combination, one of the, the Z will go to one of the four X outputs, and the W will go to the one of the four Y outputs. The, so there's and the, depending on the, the two of the B bits can be some combination of zero, one, two, or three, and that switches the appropriate thing. So this thing samples the RF, which is coming here. It samples the RF four times a cycle. And then that and then that goes the output of that are these it's stored on these capacitors. So you charge up each capacitor every quarter of a cycle, and now it's everything after here is analog. Following this is just a, a couple of of op amps, you know, amplifying the audio. That's all. So there's, there's it's a relatively simple, easy to understand. As opposed to you know, you look at a if you've ever looked at a schematic of a modern transceiver, you go, what are all these parts? You know, you look and say, oh my god, what is all this? Except even now, even even when you have one big block that says FPGA, and there are like. 5,000 lines going into it. You don't know what's inside there. There's still a lot of parts around there. And you're just, what are these all doing? It takes a lot of time to look at a schematic and try and figure out what all these extra things are. This thing has, this thing has four to transform a couple resistors and a chip. So, um, and it's quite sensitive. Uh, the QC, the QCX, uh, I, I tell this story. Tell this story about the QCX, which has the same receiver. I was up one night late, like the two a.m., and I turn on my QCX just to see what's on on forty meters, and I hear V seventy three something calling CQ. V seventy three. What, what the hell is V seventy three? Is it one of the islands? No. So I get pull out the book. I look. V seventy three is the Marshall Islands. Okay, on 40 meters, he's calling CQ. I mean, he's reared the X calling CQ and no one's answering him. So I, I, I figure with five watts, I'm not going to get him, but, but I'll connect my, I'll switch my antenna back to my 7300, which must, which will make it, it'll be easier to hear him and at least have 100 watts. So I switch the antenna and I turn on the 7300 and he isn't any louder on the 7300. Than he was on my QCX. The QCX was every bit as sensitive as my 7300. Now the 100, by the way, the 100 watts didn't work either, so I had to go to the TARC remote and point the beam at him to get him. But and right after I got him, a pileup descended. So it was one of those lovely kind where you catch catch the DX ahead of the pileup. But the the idea is these receivers, these quadrature detector receivers. Are actually very sensitive. They're not. They're not. You know, simple kind of. Oh, look, it's just a couple. How how good can they be? The answer is they're quite sensitive. So, so the whole QDX is basically a relatively simple receiver, at least the RF part, and a re, and a rel, an even simpler transmitter. So, and here's just the the, the other part of this. It's just it's just um, the the I and Q signals each have a separate path, and the output of this is, is audio. It goes to an analog to digital converter. So why an A to D? Because what you want to be sending to to the to back to the transmitter is audio, right? But you don't want this audio. You need to combine the I and Q and generate the stereo. So you, you digitize it, and the microprocessor then turns this digital stuff back into a USB audio stream. The microprocessor on here is a STM 4030, STM 32 F402. Runs at, I think, a couple hundred megahertz. It's got a lot of RAM and a lot of um, 
a lot of code space. It has built in, it acts as a built in, has built into the microprocessor a USB communications. It can do USB, it will emulate USB audio as well as USB digital. Um, and so the microprocessor turns it, turns it into audio and then sends it out as USB audio. I mean, it's digit, USB audio, of course, is a digital screen, but it's, it's digital samples. Okay, so anyway, so the audio part is now coming back and, and at your, compu your computer has no, it just sees audio as if it were coming. It doesn't know the difference between audio coming from this thing and audio coming from a commercial transceiver. It's just a series. It's just a series of audio bits at 48, sampled at 48 kilohertz. And then your computer can do all the decoding and everything. The transmit side, um, on the transmit side, there's something, there's something, Hans does something very clever here. In the audio, you get an audio stream coming out of the computer into the, which is picked up by the microprocessor. And the microprocessor looks at the audio and it can, looks and, and it determines what's the frequency, audio frequency that right now the computer is sending me. And it does this by looking at the zero crossings. I mean, you've got an audio going up and it finds where the audio goes from positive to negative. And then it finds where it goes from positive to negative again. And so between that, that time is related to the frequent audio frequency. And so by sampling the zero crossing, you can find the audio frequency and, and he actually interpolates. So just because you never get the exact zero crossing. You get one sample is a little above and one sample is a little below zero. And you can interpolate between those two to find actually what the real zero was. And so when you do that, you can detect the audio frequency to uh, better than a hertz. And, you, and it takes very little time to do this. You only need to sample a couple of cycles. So, so within, within a, a, you know, a couple hundred microseconds, you figured out what the frequency, you, that what, what audio frequency the computer wants you to send. Then you compute what what frequency do I have to program 5351. So it says, I know the frequency is 5351, dial frequency is 14074, say. It says, now I'm getting an audio frequency, which is some combination of whatever you set in your FTA base frequency, you know, like, 1527 or whatever you choose, plus that little, one of those little eight tones, which is shifted above that. And you add all those up and you just program the 5351. You just have to compute a new frequency, command the 5351, bang, the, the audio is going. There is no, there is no audio going to anything. The audio stops at the processor. And there's only one frequency. It's the frequency you've asked the 5351 to go to. And this all can happen in the time um, that it takes to go from, from frequency to frequency on FTA, which is a fraction of a second. It's actually, the process of time, it's a lot of time. It's every about every quarter of a second, I think. So so the whole, the whole device is, the whole transceiver is, has relatively few parts because you don't need a lot of extra stuff compared to um, compared to a, a full SSB rig, which is going to have you know it's going to have bandpass filters. It's going to have some kind of uh, conversion to an IF. It's going to do some processing at the IF. It's going to do depending on on you know whether it's a full digital rig. Or whether it's the standard old super hexagon, there's a lot of parts that go on in there, a lot of processing that goes on in there. Um, just the very way you can, in a, in a standard rig, the way you kind of pick out the sideband with either crystal filters or phasing or whatever, that stuff is never perfect. So in an SSB rig, you're always going to have not only the signal you want, you're going to have a little bit left over of the carrier. You're going to have a little bit left over of the suppressed sideband, and 
And so the signal is never as clean with the, with the QDX, the signal's clean because there's only one frequency it's sending at any time. And that's all you really need. And so that's, that's what's interesting about the QDX is, I mean, it's a very clever device for $55 to buy this thing that will do four bands digital, but it's that it's a new concept. It reminds you of the, what really happens when you do a lot of these digital modes. You really only want to send one single radio frequency at a time, and you're shifting it in some way periodically. But in any given instant, you're only sending one frequency. Um, some digital modes don't work that way. PSK does not work that way. PSK does a phase modulation, so it's not so simple. But um, if you look down that list of all those odd digital modes that FL, FL Digi will let you use, um, a lot of them use just plain frequency shift keying. That is where you just send the multiple frequencies, which you shift one from between uh, periodically. So that's all I have here. I, I want, there are probably questions.